Okay. Um, okay, welcome everyone to the Young Researchers of Quantum Gravity Seminar. Mm -hmm. Today, it's a great pleasure to have physicist and mathematician Roger Penrose as a speaker. Roger Penrose was awarded a Nobel Prize for Physics in 2020 for his fundamental work on black hole formation and classical gravity. But his contributions extend far beyond the singularity theorems. Many of us know Roger Penrose in relation to cosmic censorship, to conformal diagrams, spin networks, or in relation to his work on understanding consciousness from the principles of quantum mechanics. In today's seminar, he will introduce us to one of his approaches towards reconciling quantum theory with the structure of space-time within what is known as twister theory. We will hear a 45 minutes talk, which will be followed by a session of open questions from the audience. And so with this, we would like to thank you, Roger Penrose, for accepting our invitation. And please feel free to begin whenever you're ready. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I want to talk about, well, basic twister theory. So most of what I say will, will be about old stuff. And then just a little bit at the end about what is very recent. Um, twister theory, let me try and make sure I can move the slides, which is a tricky thing. I can't move the slides, why are they not moving? Um, no, it doesn't work. Ah, oh, I press that. You can click. Careful, because I'm at, I'm at, can I go backwards though? Oh yes, I can. Okay, fine, sorry. Okay, so that's the title. Basic twister theory by twisters and split, split octonians. Now the by twisters and split octonians are the new stuff, which I'm afraid I shall have to rattle through just at the end. Mainly I shall be rattling through several, many, many years, I should say, of work on twister theory, starting from the initial motivations. So the motivations, the initial motivation basically arose well, a long time ago when I was in, I guess in 19, uh, when it was in the late 90s, 50s. And I shared an office with Engelbert Schucking, and he was a wonderful person to share an office with because he he was he he knew pretty well everything you needed to know. It was unusual in that he was also an original person because usually these two qualities are, are not in the same person. But anyway, he was very useful to me. And one of the things that he emphasized to me was the importance in quantum field theory of splitting your field amplitudes into positive and negative frequencies. And another thing he stressed to me was that Maxwell's theory was conformally invariant. And I was intrigued in conformal invariance for various various reasons. I was thinking I hadn't quite worked on, on talking about scry or null infinity at that stage, but I had sort of I, my eyes on bringing infinity around to a finite place and so on, things like that. And uh, I was interested in the conformal invariance of Maxwell's theory. But the trouble with the positive and negative frequency splitting, well, that's usually something you do in terms of Fourier transform, Fourier analysis, and uh, the uh, that's not conformally invariant. But then I realized there was this other way of representing things, and this is what this picture is trying to show. You imagine the Riemann sphere, so this, this is the complex plane compactified into a sphere, and we have the equator, which is to represent the time, if you like, it goes all the way around, so time minus infinity and plus infinity are identified. And you can consider your function as a function of time, and your positive and negative frequency ones are those which depend on your conventions. I'm having it here. The convention is that you go into the into the northern hemisphere counts as positive frequency, and into the southern hemisphere counts as negative frequency. So this splitting is very much conformally invariant. So even though the splitting into the Fourier components is not conformally invariant, the splitting into positive and negative frequencies is conformally invariant, as you can see from that picture. Now, I had the idea that this is only just talking about one dimension of time. That's the equator in this picture. And I would really like to be able to do the same thing globally for the whole of space-time. I'm thinking really of Minkowski space, not just general relativity at the moment. So Minkowski space. And uh, 
how do you do that? Well, you see, you can think of complexifying Minkowski space, but then you get a space which has, um, well, four real dimensions. So when you complexify it, it's, it's eight dimensions, and the real space does not divide it into two halves, so it doesn't work. So that eye doesn't work when applied simply directly to space-time, but eventually, after a lot of uh, toing and froing, I had the idea that not thinking of space-time, but you think of the space of light rays. And the space of light rays represents the points in the space I'm talking about. That's on the right-hand side, that's the point, uh, and, the, and the, so a light ray is represented by a point. And if you want to represent a point in space-time, you represent by the family of light rays through that point. And I was well aware that the celestial sphere in relativity is really a complex one-dimensional space. It's a, a Riemann sphere in the sense of the, the, the Lorentz transformations correspond to a conformal map of the Riemann sphere or the, or the celestial sphere, if you like. The space of light rays is the celestial sphere. And that celestial sphere um, is the, the, if you have two observers looking at the same sky, moving at great speed with respect to each other, the transformation from one to the other as a conformal map of the sky. So I, I can think of it as a, as a Riemann sphere. So this is what this picture represents, the space of light rays, and a point represents the space in, in that space. Now that's the space which I want to stretch into a top half and a bottom half, and that will be the equator which divides the two spaces with the top half from the bottom half. And that is exactly what's going on here. And to be roughly, roughly speaking, the top half represents not just photons. You see this, the, the space which I'm calling Pn. I'll come back to why it's called Pn in a minute. But the space of points, um, that's the space I had a minute ago, which was just the the, the space on the right-hand side of this place here, which is five-dimensional, space of light rays is five-dimensional, and you create a six-dimensional space where you include the the sort of helicity of the of uh, of the massless particle. So I've got a plus helicity photon and a minus helicity photon, and the space of those. I'll say a little bit more why why you get a a, a complex space if you do this, but that is projective twister space. So the space T is twister space, which is a complex four-dimensional uh, vector space. But if you consider the projective space, so you're looking at the, the rays in that four-dimensional space, you have a six-dimensional real space, in other words, a, a three-complex dimensional space, that the P stands for, for projective. And so you have the top half and the bottom half, top half representing positive velocity, bottom half negative velocity. And you do, in get, do indeed get this splitting of the space into two halves in this way. So it did exactly what I wanted. It took a long time to realize what I was doing here. I won't go into the um, complications, the route which I had to take to think about this, but that was what I settled on as the right sort of thing to think about. That is the twister space, in fact. But uh, to describe the points in the top half, they're not really, you see, in this picture I have a, on the left-hand side a wiggly light ray to indicate the photon. But geometrically, it really is this object here, which I want to describe. It's why it's called a twister, if you like. This is a family of circles. It's actually a, a projection into three-dimensional space, conform, a stereographic projection it, into three space, of a family of Clifford parallels of a three sphere. So you take the, the three sphere and what people call the Hopf map, it's really, he got it from Clifford. So it's a family of circles, great circles on the three sphere and these projected stereographically into three space gives you this configuration. And that's why it's called a twister because you have these circles all twisting around each other. And they do represent a point in the top half or the bottom half. It's right-handed if it's in the top half and left-handed in the bottom half. Now, I should explain where that configuration comes from. And one way of doing it is the following picture. It's a bit of a mess. Don't worry about that. But this, again, you can see PT T plus. That's the top half of twisted space and the bottom half of projective, sp projective space. That is the P. So we're looking at 
six dimensional real spaces, in other words, three complex dimensional spaces split into two halves. And if you take a point in the top half, see what does that represent? Well, that's that point Z alpha um, in the top left part of this picture. And the, the uh, um, dual of that is a plane. And you have a form which is, has a three pluses, four, two pluses and two minuses. So it's symmetrical with regard to plus and minus. Um, and the, um, that form, with respect to that form, you have a, a dual to the point, and that's a plane. And that plane intersects the real space, that's the space of light rays, in that little thing, red thing in the middle. The red thing is the is the PN space we just had before, and the to, to see to to represent that point Z, you think of the plane which is its dual that cuts the space of light rays in that little bit in the middle there, and each straight line through Z, um, which meets that thing in the middle, meets it in a circle. You see the line through Z is a line, but that line is a complex line, so it's a sphere. And that sphere meets the uh, blue thing in a circle. And as that line moves around, joining all the points in that intersection to that point, you get a whole family of circles. The whole region is a, is a three sphere. It's so S3 at the top represents that intersection of the plane with, with PN. And we therefore have this three sphere, and that three sphere is fibered into this projective space here. So the, in, in this Clifford, family of Clifford parallels. So I, I knew about all this from, um, it really came from a configuration that Ivor Robinson had been playing with. He was looking at, at, at families of light rays because he was looking at how you represent a, um, a family of shear free uh, light rays and this family of shear-free right rays he considered to be joining um, joined to a a a, a line a, a, a single light ray and that single light ray is displaced in the complex and then you look at the real part of it all that's that's what it started from so the idea came from Ivor Robinson basically but um, this was what this uh, I don't think he knew that it was a Clifford parallels but that was what I concluded it was, and I realized this is just what I was looking for, because it was a, uh, you see this real space divided into, or well, the complex space divided into two halves, and you have the real things you, which you see directly, which are the light rays uh, on, the, on the intersection. What to do with it took a long time. Um, there were a curious story when I, I won't go into that, I'll talk about it later. But it, it's easier to Think about these things in terms of two component spinners. So that's really the the, uh, the key thing to to play with in order to get these constructions. Here we have uh, what a two geometrically what a two component spinner um, is. On the right hand side, I have a little flag which represents the two component spinner. That little flag is a null flag, so its flag pole lies along the light cone. And so therefore, I see on the left-hand side, the direction of that flagpole is a point. So you see a particular point on that, on that sphere, which is, represents the direction of the, of the two spinner. And the flag plane gives you the phase of the spinner, if you like. And that is represented by a tangent plane to the sphere. So you have that little arrow on the, on the left-hand side, which represents the intersection of that flag plane with the space-like plane in, on the right-hand side, which cuts through the cone to give you the sphere, which is on the left-hand side. So this gives you a representation of two-spinner. It's complete representation of two-spinner up to a sign. The, the two-spinner is a spinner object, so that if you rotate it through two pi, it becomes its negative. You have to rotate it again through two pi to get back to where it was. So the flag plane, as it goes once round, all the way around to where it started, then it's become its negative. Uh, so you have to keep this in mind, but apart from that, it's a nice geometrical representation of a two spinner. Okay, now what's the representation of a, of a twister? Well, the twister is described by two two component spinners. One of them is the thing I'm calling omega at the bottom, and the other one I'm calling pi. 
The reasons for those two letter, Greek letters is pi is what oh, it represents P, it's a momentum, and then the letter P is usually used for momentum, a four momentum, so that the pi represents the momentum of this massless particle, if you write. The, I'm thinking of the case of a real light ray for in here in this case, so, so the, lead, the light ray Z um, has a particular direction which is represented by the pi, which is it's also it's got a momentum to it, so it's got a scale to it, as which pi, the, the size of pi, if you like, gives you its scale of the momentum. And what is omega? Well, it really gives you the moment about the origin. So it's, so it's an angular momentum thing. It gives you the moment about the origin. And so that little spinner at the bottom is the omega part, and the pi part is the one you see at the top. Those, those two spinners represent, mm -hmm. those two, two spinners represent the twister. So the twister is a pair of two spinners. Actually, let me go back to that in a minute. Um, if they represent an actual light ray, then they, it's a condition that that, two, that pair of objects, um, you have, a, you have a, a norm on it, which uh, tells you it's the pi times omega bar plus, um, pi plus omega times pi bar. And that those two things give you the norm of a twister. If that norm is zero, then you have a light ray, just in the case here. If the norm is not zero, then it still gives you a twister, but you can't represent it as a light ray. And that's where we go back to the, to the well, this thing we had before. So you can certainly see, represent it. And it does represent a, a particle with spin, which I'll come to later, but for the moment, it's just a piece of geometry. Okay. Now, you can use uh, these things or the two spinner notation very conveniently to represent massless fields. And I just wanted to indicate uh, the kind of algebra that one uses all the time here, algebra of two spinners. And uh, when you, I like to use abstract indices so that when I write A or A prime, A is the spinner index, A prime is the complex conjugate spinner index. Um, B is a spinner index, B prime is a complex conjugate spinner index. And if you want to make a vector out of it, you have to, ha to have one of each. So you have a prime and an unprime together. And the abstract no index notation means I can write little a actually stands for the abstract index a. And that you can think of also as a shorthand for a, a prime. So it's, it's a convenient notation. You can convert back between the tensor notation and the um, two spinner notation. Um, just, just, I always kicked myself because there was a time when I think John Wheeler and, and various people wanted to know what notation people should be using for tensors and vectors. And I didn't re reply. I should have replied because everybody else wanted to have Greek letters for tensors. And I, and I would have said, no, 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 no. I want to have Latin letters. Because if you use Greek letters, then the capitals, it's terrible because they don't have a proper alphabet, which you can tell when you're using Greek letters and when you're not. So I said, no, no, you should have. I didn't say that was kicking myself off. I've always used Latin letters for the reason that you can use it, translate backwards between spinners and vectors very conveniently in this way. But anyway, never mind about that. Um, so the little letter A for the uh, tensor index corresponds to capital A, capital A prime. And it really, an index, the abstract indices, they are the same thing. But the point about the, tw the spinners is you can manipulate the individual parts and flip them around without moving the tensor indices around as a whole. That's very limited. And you can do write down the metric. It's a product of the epsilon with the epsilon primed. And the, the epsilon is a two-dimensional um, uh, skew object. So it's a very simple object. And uh, now here at the bottom, I've got the maximal field tensor. Uh, and I've got the vial curvature tensor. Zero rest mass fields in general are represented by symmetrical tensors. And the general field equation I've got at the bottom, you write down this symmetric n index. Well, so that's a 2s index where s is the spin. Uh, and that all, of, all unprimed or all primed, depending on whether it's left-handed part or the right-handed part. 
the left-handed part is or unprimed. I think I've got the conventions that way around. <coughs> if you want to represent the Maxwell field tensor, then you can split it into the two parts, the self-dual and the anti-self-dual part. One part is represented by a symmetric two-spinner, phi AB, and then you complement that with the epsilon, gives you a skew-to-metric tensor. That being I think anti-self-dual. And then the other part is the is the complex conjugate part. And if you want the vial curvature, this is where it really makes a lot of simplification, because the vial curvature as a tensor is a complicated object. You've got to remove all the twists, all the uh, traces of the, of the vial curvature, which to do explicitly is a little bit complicated. But in spinners, it's very, very simple, because the, the uh, symmetry of the vial curvature in spinners is simply completely symmetrical. So your psi represents the vial spinner, and that's got four symmetrical indices, a couple of epsilons to make it into a tensor. And then you've got the anti-self-dual and the self-dual parts. I guess the left-handed and right-handed parts, whichever they're way around it is. And they sat, they, all of them satisfy the zero rest mass field equation. So it makes a nice kind of uh, way of talking about zero rest mass fields all at once. Okay. Now, how do you do this with twisters? Well, this picture, um, I should perhaps have started with an easier picture, which is to represent nice, simple fields which satisfy the massless field equations. Um, you can do these things, which I call elemental, elementary, elemental states, I think they were. No, elementary states, sorry. And these are particular simple uh, fields. But let me not bother about this. I want to describe a general positive frequency field if zero rest mass field. And I can do this with this construction. Now, the left-hand side says twister space, and I have on this twister space a homogeneous function. The degree of homogeneity represents the spin, or the helicity, really. So I'm calling S the helicity. S could be positive or negative. S positive means right-handed, as far as I remember. S negative means left-handed. and um, if you uh, have a function which is homogeneous to the degree minus 2s minus 2, that gives a solution, a general solution of the field equations, of the massless field equations. And this picture describes how you get it. The field has to have a property of having singularities which are separated in the top half. This is to make it into a wave function, make it positive frequency. So it's separate, it has singularities which are separated in the top half. The, the elementary states were constructed by having two planes where your singularities lay, and these two planes intersected in the bottom half. And so the top half, you had the two singularities, singular regions, which were on these two planes. So the planes were, were in the denominator, and so therefore gave you poles of some sort. So these two regions represent singularities. Now, I have an arbitrary line in the top half. If that line, that line would represent a point in space-time, if it was on Pn, it would be a real point. If it's in, moved up into the top half, that's a point in the forward tube. So the thing is, if you want to have a, a solution of the field equations, which are non-singular in the forward tube, that gives you a positive frequency solution, that, which you can use as a wave function. So that's the idea. I'm thinking of wave functions, and they would be positive frequency uh, um, solutions of the zero S mass equations. And you get these, get these automatically by this construction. You construct, you take a general ho holomorphic function, which is homogeneous of degree, degree minus 2S minus 2, and its singularities are separated in the top half. And then you take your line in the top half, which represents a point in the forward tube. That's where you want it to be non-singular. It reaches into two, two separate regions. Now you look at the right half of this picture and you do your contour integral, which is a closed contour on that sphere. In other words, on that, that projected line, which is lying in the top half there, which is, is, which is topologically a sphere. And you do your integral around that contour and that splits the singularities, singularities on two sides, 
and it gives you a non-singular function. So that was the construction which I had. It looks awfully complicated to do this, and I struggled with trying to understand what I was doing for a long time. I can't remember the, the reasoning behind it all, but I had a problem which I needed to get solved, and I couldn't quite see what I was doing. And I consulted his singer about this, and he said, oh, to solve that problem, you just solve these equations. And I, I went back to Oxford. I was in the US at that point. Went back to Oxford, and I asked Michael Atiyah because I didn't want to solve the equations. And he immediately took me to the blackboard and explained what it was all about. <laughs> and it has to do what, what uh, cohomology. Cohomology, yes. This is where we're driven. What is cohomology? Well, I'm talking about first cohomology. I can describe what that is. I'm talking about not functions on the top half of twisted space. I'm talking about elements of cohomology on the top half of twisted space. So what are they? Well, I think of this, it's really going back to this previous picture where they have functions, which that would be a representative of the cohomology. It's got singularities in two, those two separated regions in the top half. The way I'm thinking about it, is I'm looking at the places where it's non-singular. And this bottom half, the picture doesn't look much like the previous picture, but think of the two humps, the two camel humps in that picture as being the left-hand side and the right-hand side, which are not shaded in the top half of this picture. So that's where the camel humps are. So that's where you get your singularities in the function. So the function has got singularities in those two separated regions, and the contour integral will take place in the intersection of those two regions. But the cohomology way of looking at it is, I'm thinking of the top half of the twister space as covered by two open sets. So this is check cohomology. I have two open sets which cover the top half of twister space. One is the left-hand part, which includes the dotted part in the middle. One is the right-hand part, which includes the dotted part in the middle. The union of these two regions is the whole region I'm looking at. The intersection of these two regions is the region where my function is defined. So the function is defined on the intersection of the pair of regions. And when I do my contour integral, it's on that intersection region. Now you see in general in cohomology, you split your thing, you may split your space into into a zillion different regions. There may be a whole lot of them. But you can get away with two here, which is the nice thing about it. And this is the simple thing that you can, it's good enough for what we want to say here. But if you want to know the invariance of it, you see what you would do Lorentz transformation, and then this thing got all twisted around. And what used to be a nice splitting into two halves is in a different place. So we want to add something to something which is ro rotated, it's a mess. So what you really have to do is think of these as this cohomology element where you factored out by all these things and the cohomology remains independent of how you've described it in terms of this splitting into these two halves here. Now that's a long story. I'm certainly not going into it, but I just want to give you a sort of how we run through. This is a quick run through twister, twister theory. It's driven into this notion that your functions are described by cohomology on the, if I'm talking about wave functions, on the top half of twister space. Cohomology is sort of understood if you take this picture, you see locally, it's, a, it, it's you've got, you know what it means, but cohomology describes the discrepancy in trying to fit this together as a whole. If you imagine splitting this into pieces, you can imagine splitting it into two halves by say slicing it um, horizontally by a plane, which cuts the top half a sort of, um, lambda shaped thing and the bottom half which is the rest of it and you uh, glue it together and you try to glue it together in a way which uh, gives you something interesting not just trivial and this thing just gives you a, a, a an element of cohomology which is what this just this triangle describes one way of describing cohomology is to talk about impossible objects i won't really go into that here but i just thought i'd say it now, once you've got the hang of cohomology, which I don't expect, if you haven't known it already, probably this rapid description isn't good enough to explain the idea. But nevertheless, that's what it is really doing. So this is now going way back to the motivation right at the beginning is finally realized. It took ages and ages. I can't remember how many years it was, 
It really does do what the picture on the left is trying to do. You're splitting your positive and negative frequencies into two halves. You're, sorry, you're, you're splitting your function into two halves. Your positive frequency part is in the, extends into the top half. Your negative frequency part extends into the bottom half. And the, the analogy here is very close. But now it's not functions, it's cohomology. The cohomology which splits into the top half describes positive frequency, into the bottom half describes negative frequency. So it finally achieved what I was trying to do after many years. So it was a, a great uh, re relief to see it really did it. Your PN is the space which represents the light rays, and that's what you see most directly. And your, your wave functions, you can see, extend them into the top or the bottom half. And that's what, sorry, that's what I'm just describing here. Now, there's another thing about this, which is, uh, I can only mention rather briefly, quickly. You see, here I have a function to describe how I glue the left half and the right half together. And the function is then described as a cohomology on the whole space. Now, cohomology is something else. It allows you to, to deform your space. So I can consider an infinitesimal, an infinitesimal deformation of my space. I can describe that as cohomology. You can imagine building your space out of the different pieces of the cohomology pasted together, and that gives you a space out of pasted together out of bits. Here I'm just thinking of pasting my space out of two bits, but I'm now not just thinking of that passively sitting on the intersection here, but I'm thinking of it as doing something. I'm sliding one half away from the other half. So my twister space is glued together over that patch in the middle. I'm afraid it's rather a messy picture. I got it from my previous picture and cutting it up and gluing it together, I'm afraid, rather hastily. Sorry about that. But once you've moved one half of the twister space with respect to the other, what used to be a straight line going through, I'm drawing it as a sort of space line, it's really a, a sphere, that long <laughs> A pencil thing in the middle, which is really a sphere, and that's you can see that on the right hand side of the sphere. But that sphere has to go through smoothly from one side to the other. And to doing so, in doing so, it produces a sphere. If it's just an infinitesimal displacement, it gives you a function which describes the infinitesimal displacement. If it's a genuinely finite displacement, it actually gives you a solution of the Einstein equations. So this was, I call the nonlinear graviton construction. It gives you complex solutions of the Einstein equations by means of this very construction. In fact, you can do it explicitly. You can find a function which moves this thing, in fact, not just infinitesimally, but by a finite amount, by using generating functions, you can move it by a finite amount. It's a bit of a job to find where those uh, Riemann spheres are. There's a theorem which tells you that there are, this is the theorem due to Kodara, which tells you if this move but isn't too much, it's a finite displacement, but not too much. Uh, oh dear, I've got to move my thing here, sorry. Okay, there we go. Uh, that finite displacement actually gives you a finite solution of the Einstein equations. The trouble is, it's a complex solution, that's all right, but the main trouble is that it is a solution which is of positive helicity. So it means that your vial curvature, half of it is zero and the other half is not. When I say half, I mean the self-dual and the anti-self-dual part. I think the self-dual part is zero and the anti-self-dual part is there, uh, and that gives you a left-handed graviton. So I thought, well, we've, this is the problem. All you've got to do is try and find uh, how to do the right-handed half. Well, I can do. I can just change all my conventions, and I get the same construction giving you the right hand, but I want to put them together. And how on earth do I do it? Well, that's what's called the googly problem, because the googly is a cricket ball, which is bowled such a way to look like a right-handed spinning particle, and it actually spins left-handed. I've got—I can't remember whether I got my left and right the right way around, but never mind. It's—it's it's, maybe it's the left-handed one, and you're trying to make it spin right-handed. I think it's that test. Um, anyway, that's that's the googly problem. 
and it's been with us for a long, long time. I, there are various ways of trying to get around this problem, but the way I want to describe getting around this problem is trying to follow this route. And to follow this route, let me go and talk about quantized twisters. I did talk about the angular momentum and momentum before, and I talked about the omega and the pi before. The picture in red on the right-hand side is what I gave you before, but now I want to go a little bit further and to say that it actually describes the momentum and the angular momentum, strictly speaking. Now, the momentum is given by the pi part. I did say that before. You multiply pi by pi bar, and that gives you p, which is the momentum vector, four vector. The angular momentum is also given when you mix the pi's and the omegas together, and that is the expression given at the bottom right-hand side of this picture. Now, I want to say this in a slightly different context. Suppose you quantize your objects, so we're talking about quantum theory now, then P and M have a quantum commutation rule, so that P and M become operators which do not commute, they satisfy a certain commutation rule. Now that commutation rule comes very beautifully out of a twister commutation rule, which is a commutation rule between Z and its complex conjugate Z bar. You see you've got, you've got barred quantities and non-barred quantities, so the twister involved in the P and the M involve both the twister Z and its complex conjugate. So this is what I want to do. I want to combine the, the, the commutation rule is now written here. Z and Z bar are canonical commut commutated. They're canonically, uh, co canonically commute objects and they're canonically conjugate variables. So the Zs commute with themselves. That's the bottom first part of the bottom line. And the Z bars commute with themselves. That's the second part of the bottom line. But the Z and the Z bars say that have this con canonical commutation rule between the two. And if you have this very simple canonical commutation rule for the twisters, that gives you the complicated looking commutation law that momentum and angular momentum actually have in Minkowski space. Now I'm doing the same thing here, but I'm just thinking of what I'm calling now a bi-twister. A bi-twister has a, both a twister part and a, and a and a dual twister part. So at the top part, I have the script A represents the bi-twister. It has an ordinary commutating twister as the coefficients of the Z part and a dual twister as the coefficients of the Z bar part, which I'm calling do W. So W is really Z bar, if it's real, but I'm thinking, I'm mean, allowing it to wander around by itself independently of Z. Okay, so the bi-twister is the object curly A, which has eight components, eight complex components. Four of them are in the downstairs A. The other four are in the upstairs A. I'm, I'm writing it as A again. I could have perhaps have chosen a different letter, but when the index is up, it means a different thing. They're completely independent objects from the, from the other A. When I make it a real bi-twister, then I want to make it the complex conjugate of the lower A, but I don't have to do that for the moment. Now, these bi-twisters are not commuting objects. They have a commutation rule, which is, comes directly from the commutation of the Zs with the Zs, which you had before, Ws with the Ws, and the Zs with the Z Ws, which give you the um, canonical commutation rule, um, which I hope I've written down there. You can't see it. Because I... Yes, the Z, Zs with Ws, that's right, at the first of the middle line, and Z with Zs and the Ws with Zs as a second part of the middle line. And uh, for a real bi-twister, I say that the A upper is actually the complex conjugate of the A down, the down so the A of the, of the downstairs A. Okay, now, now I construct this triple object which is constructed out of three bi-twisters. I multiply them together and I form this sum, which is, you see this funny notation on the sum, I've got plus or minus uh, wiggly arrow, circular arrow. What that means is that sum consists of six terms, 
where I consider all permutations of A, B, and C, all six possible permutations, but added together with a minus sign when it's an odd permutation. So that's what it means. So that triple bracket is that expression on the right-hand side at the bottom there, where I have a minus sign whenever it's an odd permutation. <laughs> Now, this is all just saying what happens, and you work it through, and, and uh, I won't go through the details of this. Um, I'm calling that a bi-twister, and I have this operation of multiplying them together. It's a, it's a triple, triple product. I have a, given three bi-twisters, I can construct a fourth one. So that's what it is. It's not an ordinary product of two. Now, uh, if I have a real bi-twisters, then I make their a equals a bar and so on and so forth. And then it turns out that the stripper product is real also. Okay, now, what more do I get? I have an object which I call multiplying by i object. I need that too. And I, what it, I, the definition of that is given by the second line here, it's the, product of A with B, now that's the ordinary product of A with B, not the triple product I told you, and I then um, times, I put that expression that you see there. That's the multiplying by I operation. Now the point about these things is that they are, these are things which, well they involve H, H cross, they all, all are, I, sorry, I, I don't know if I've gone back the right way, I meant to say, yes, I did that bit, yeah, I did this bit. Now, I'm so sorry, I had all this before. I seem to be going backwards. Oh, I see why I'm going backwards, sorry, yes. Yes, don't worry about the complications all there. So I've got a product of three bi-twisters. Now what I want to say is that these things actually, um, I should I should put I should have put Planck's constant in the in the in the products. I think I did. Yes, you could see it on the right hand side. But these expressions that I get all depend on Planck's constant. If Planck's constant was zero, everything would vanish and I wouldn't get anything. So they really are quantum objects which I'm talking about here. I then make put Planck constant equal to one, so you don't clutter them <coughs> right at the top. Anyway, I can put Planck's constant to take it to one and then I don't worry about it anymore. But these objects are quantum expressions. And these are real, real by twisters. And that is the uh, multiplying by I operation, which also is, is defined when I have the um, when I have the, the, the by twister operation. Sorry. Oh yes, no, that's why I could put, put, put it H, H cross equal to one because all these quantities go to zero when H goes to zero. <clears throat> and then I have this algebra, which is a quantum algebra. Now, if I want to construct the split octonians, I need to introduce a unit element. So this is the element E, um, which is constructed out of a particular uh, by twister, which I choose, and it's and it has a <coughs> e um, the the bottom line. You see, e times e is got equal to is equal to two. That it, it that's just to make it a unit element. Never mind why it's two and not one. It's because it counts itself twice. <laughs> that's really roughly speaking why. So the element e. You choose this arbitrarily, but where E is a positive, um, well, I want its unit, I want its unit product with itself to be positive, so I can normalize it to be one. And then um, I can construct the object, which is the middle line here in the, in the page here is a product, is a multiple of E, and that is a a, and a multiple of a, a, a multiple of which is orthogonal to e. You see, the w, the the z part is is. I don't know if I said it right. No, here we have that's what I'm trying to say. Here we have a vector. Any any bi twister can be represented 
as a sum of what I'm calling a real part or a, a scalar part and a vector part. It's like quaternions in that sense. So the, sc <coughs> the scalar part is defined by curly A, the S at the top. So it's a multiple of E, that's the scalar part. And the vector part is what's left. So the, the scalar part is one dimension and the, the vector part is seven dimensions. So that gives you what's left. And the scalar part is orthogonal to the vector part. And it's very much like what you do when you construct quaternions. You have a scalar part and a vector part, and the cross product is, comes from multiplying the vector parts together. And quaternions represent the two um, operations of vector calculus. You've got the scalar product on the, this part of the scalar part, and the vector part as the product of the vector part. And with the, um, the bi-twisters, you do pretty well the same thing, but now the vector part is represented in terms of the triple part, and I have to put the imagine, take the um, multiplying by i part. I could have put that on the outside rather than all the way through it. Just the conventions work better with putting it all the way through, but never mind. Anyway, this gives you the split octonians, and so it's it's a, a way of seeing that within the bi twister construction you can uh, provide a representation or uh, a way of um, uh, demonstrating the, these very curious objects, the Spitoctonians. I get wondering whether they've got anything to do with particle physics, which they might have. You have, uh, if you don't fix your unit element, then you have what's called spin three, four, um, which is uh, a, more, a bit, much bigger group. But the group of uh, symmetries of the uh, split octonians is a thing called G G2 star, which is a, a very remarkable uh, special group. Um, there's another thing I want to say about this. What, what is I was going to say? Yes. Now, you see, you, the hope would be that this has something to do with how you would construct um, a, a, re a resolution of the problem that I had before of trying to get your twisters to represent equally the right and left-handed part. You see, there is this curious fact that twister theory started off by trying to split a space into two halves, giving you the positive and the negative frequency. And you go through the rigmarole of twister theory and you end up with something which does that. It splits it into two halves, but it's really giving you positive and negative helicity, not make no positive negative frequency. And it sort of muddied the two ideas together. They shouldn't really be muddied together. You want to have a formalism which is symmetrical between the two things. And the positive, I mean, it's really sort of the positive negative frequency are also there in one of the things some of the things I was describing, because that was also true, but it's it's sort of muddled up with the helicity, and positive frequency is muddled up with positive helicity. So to get it unmuddled, you, you want something which equally describes a twister and a dual twister. So I'm saying that these objects, the um, the, the bi-twisters, the curly A thing at the top of this plex here, is really something which could be used to describe general relativity. That you, you've got a right-hand part and a left-hand part, and then you try and do the nonlinear graviton construction, but with the whole thing, rather than just with the twister space, do it apply to the bi-twister space. Now, I haven't done that. I haven't seen how to do that. I barely tried. So, so I'm tell, telling you something which is sort of at the cusp of what I'm trying to do now. So sorry if it's got confusing. Thank you very much for listening. All right. Um, let's all thank Roger Penrose for this inspiring and illuminating talk. And with this, I think we can open the question session. So if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand or type your question in the chat. Uh, you may also use the Google form for anonymous questions, which will then be re read by a person from the YRQG committee. Leave it, I think I might want to, to move on. Yeah. Okay, so please go ahead.
Um, yeah, I can see Tobias has a, a question. Please unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, so thanks a lot for this uh, very nice talk. First, um, I wanted to ask, so most of what you presented here uh, seem to rely a lot um, of on, on masslessness, right? Um, so so how, how does mass come into play in this uh, Twister framework? Well, I think of it normally in the sort of way you think of an electron. Well, I mean, when I, when I say you think of it that way, it can be thought of. I mean, a Dirac spinner really is a pair of spinner of two spinners, uh, right-handed and left-handed, or, or say a primed and an unprimed spinner. So the way you would think about mass would be as a sort of interacting pair of fields, one talking about the right-handed part and the left-handed part. It's a sort of Zitter Bewegen thing too, of course. So you've got this bit jumping between right and left-handedness. So when you write things in two spinners, that's really the way I would do it. So you would think of massless things, well, for, for a spin half, you, you would have the, the, the two parts, like splitting the Dirac spinner in two pieces. If you have higher spin, well, you're really basically looking at, I mean, the basic paper which does this the best way is Dirac. I mean, they have all these different, what do they call nothing Kimmer, and I can't remember them all, the, diff the different ways of writing higher spins. But Dirac had this paper in which he described all the spins at once using two spinners quite remarkably. So this is where I learned about these things often from this Dirac paper. So you can talk about particles of higher spin representing them in terms of pairs of two spinner representations. So that would be the way I do it, but I haven't thought too much about putting mass in. And you're a very good point to raise this question, because as you say, uh, it has been very geared to thinking about massless objects. Clearly, when you bring mass in, then you've got uh, other groups coming in which involve Rotating the, rotating the two parts around, around with each other and sure. But then you lose your conformal invariance too. So mass has to be something uh, which, well, I'm interested particularly in massless things also because at the two ends of the universe, if you like, when you look at the very remote future, well, the very remote future, I'm thinking may, may, dominated by photons. And the, when you're looking at the Big Bang, then your energies get so big that mass becomes a secondary quantity and, and every, everything is effectively massless. So that when you try to join the future, remote future to the past, you're really talking about massless objects again. But you're right to bring up, I mean, you obviously have to handle mass, absolutely right. And what's the best way to do it? I tend to think the best way to do it is to write things in two spinners and then mass becomes a bit of a um, composite kind of notion at that stage. Okay, I see. Thanks a lot. All right, so there is another raised hand, um, but also a question in the chat. Let me first read the question in the chat, and then we can let Igor Mo ask his question. So the question in the chat by Sophie is, why is the construction in the end called split octonians and not just octonians? <laughs> Yes, the split octonians because the quadratic form that you come up with, I didn't sort of stress that. Um, I could find it again, I guess. The quadratic form you come up with, with the E's at the end. Is it there? No, it's there. Yes. Yes, there, I can't quite see where it's written. You do, you do have a quadratic form. Uh, the quadratic form is four pluses and four minuses. So ordinary octonians, you'd have all plus, 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 plus. With the, uh, it's basically if you write down, I mean, I have wondered about whether twister theory might be connected with split octonians for quite a long time. And it took the lockdown, I think, for me to have enough time to think about these things. Um, and actually to look at what I'd been worrying about before. You see, if you take the twister scalar product, you've got two twisters, and you 
just take the scalar product and you write it down in terms of real and imaginary parts, you've got each twister has got four components and they're complex. So when you write them in real and imaginary parts, you've got eight numbers. And those eight numbers, the, the quadratic form has got four pluses and four minuses. So the natural quadratic form connected with twister theory is that split octonionic form. So it's plus, 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 minus, 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 minus. And so that means that you're, you're going to have divisors of zero and things like that, as you, as you do have with, well, split quaternions are not really such a nice subject. It's, the octonians do split nicely <laughs> into, into, uh, into four pluses and four minuses. Um, so, the, so it's not quite the same as the octonians. The algebra, they complexify. This. So if you, if you take the complexified version of each, they're, they're identical. So complexified octonians are indeed the same as complexified split octonians. But when you, when you make the real objects, then the split octonians have this natural quadratic form, which has um, four pluses and four minuses. I, I can't see my slides very well to see whether, which one I should be staring at. Uh, yes, the quadratic form's in here, I think. Yes, it's at the bottom. That's right. A dot B. That's what it is, yes. But that's before I put H cross equal to one. I've got A dot B. You can define it in terms of um, the expression at the bottom, yes. A lower A, upper B, plus upper A, lower B. And the upper and lower comes from the multiplying by I operation. Is that right? Um, Anyway, it's the a dot b. Yes, the a dot b comes from the from the multiplying by i operation. So, so you can see that in the middle line, and then that gives you the quadratic form that you get out of that has four pluses and four minuses. So that's why it's split octonians. But I sh guess I should have said that. Thank you for the question. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the answer. So there are questions in the Google form, but first of all, um, Igor Mol wanted to ask a question. Please unmute yourself. I believe that palatial twisters and ambitwisters are proposals to solve the Google problem. So mm -hmm. what's the relation between palatial twisters and ambitwisters to the split octonium by twisters that you explained to us today? Well, they're more closely re related to... to... <clears throat> um, sorry, you, you said the word a minute ago and it's gone out of my head. <clears throat> You have bi twisters. <clears throat> Sorry. Ambi twisters, you necessarily have to have the scalar product zero. You see, they're talking really about um, complex light, complex null geodesics. And the, the problem arises when you try to make the scalar product not equal to zero. When it's, when it's zero, you can have the geometric interpretation as a light ray or it could be a complex light ray. And that's really where ambitwisters is going. It's not resolving the problem of, how do I say it? Uh, the googly problem, I, I don't regard it really as solving the googly problem because you're not going into the complex analysis part of the, of the uh, Twister space. You're 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 concentrating on the on the light rays. I mean, it's all right. If you want to talk about light rays, and and there's a theory of these things. So the, the, those are ambi twisters, but they're not the same. Now you're asking me about palatial twisters. That's right. Now I think palatial twisters are related to these things more closely. Um, it was the trouble is it so look, took so long for that article to come out. I'd always forgotten about them at the time. It is out now. That is in the new the new spaces um, volume, and that came out just just very very recently. So that article does have palatial twisters in it, but since I hadn't, hadn't seen that article for so long, which is about I don't know how long it's about five years or longer than that I think. 
before the final proofs went in and the, and the article actually appeared. It was a great length of time. Now those you see, I think you, you have a, a pair, a twister and a dual twister in the same way. See, the, the bi-twisters are relating them in this very particular way in which you have the non-commutative rule of multiplication. Whereas the palatial twisters, I don't think I had that. I think they need to be combined with palatial twisters. They're much closer to palatial twisters than they are to ambitwisters. Because ambitwisters, you have to restrict them to have a zero scalar product, if you like, so that you really are talking about light rays. And you, you don't try to interpret them, if I have it right. I'm not sure how, where ambitwisters has gone, because I didn't really follow the subject in too much detail. But I, I, that was my understanding of, of where it goes. You really are talking about complex and algodesics. But you see, you're, you're already on the space PN. You haven't got off it in a way. So you're not really talking about these twisting things, which are like trying to go off the line, the place PN. You're trying to wander out into, into the top or bottom half of twister space. But I think that probably by using this non commutative picture here, you see, the palatial twisters, I don't know, it needs thinking about more. I mean, good, it's a problem. Think about how palatial twisters relate to bi-twisters. But they do, in a sense, relate quite closely because you've got proper twisters in the sense of having a full twister space. Um, I'd have to remind myself whether were the, the uh, palatial twisters I don't think you had a geometrical interpretation of them. You needed to take a neighborhood or something and, and extend them in that neighborhood and you have to have a way of joining them up from one neighborhood to the next. And you can use a generating function to do that. I think to, it would be very worthwhile to explore the connection between bi twisters and palatial twisters. There could be something interesting there. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, would you like to follow up? Yes, please. Oh, no, thank you for the homework. Okay. <laughs> oh, yes. No, please let me have the homework. When you've, when you've done it, let me have it, please. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, Tobias, would you like to read the questions from the Google form? Yes, sure. Uh, so we got uh, three questions. Um, so the first one is, can you explain again the relation between projective twister space, CP3, and the motivating case of the Riemann sphere in two dimensions? There you have CP1, uh, which is compactified C, but in four complex dimensions, C4, the complexified Minkowski space, uh, has a compactification CP4, not CP3. So can you explain again this missing <laughs> dimension? Yes, let's see if I can I can answer your question. I have to go back to the probably the early things we had, didn't we? Things like that. Um, this picture. Well, you see, it's not directly connected. Well, this this really. Um, see, Minkowski space is the left hand space, and that's. Twister space is on the right hand side here. Now I'm not, you see, you can compactify Minkowski space, certainly, as you were saying, which gives you um well it's it's a it's a if it also depends on how many times you go around and so on. You can immediately compactify it and you you get a, an S1 cross S3. Um by gluing the scry plus to scry minus. There's also a question of whether you want to go four times around because the, 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 the twister, you can pick up a factor of i every time you go around. So there's a little bit of a problem there. I think I call the Gergen index. Um, now, that of course is a different space from the twister space. The twister space, um, you're looking at well, you're looking at the light rays, if you like, to begin with, but then that only gives you Pn. It doesn't give you the uh, complex parts. So you'd have to complexify it. Let's just try and think. 
And you can take the Minkowski sphere base and look at the alpha planes and beta planes in it, sure. But you've got to complexify it. So it's not, it's not the real space. The alpha planes in complexified Minkowski space will give you the points in the twisted space. And the alpha planes will only, if they're, if you're lucky, then they intersect the real space in an actual null geodesic. If you're not so lucky, they won't intersect the real space. Whereas you can represent them using the um, Robinson congruences or the, the twister picture. So that's the picture here. So that's a bit complicated. Um, it's a space of alpha planes. I mean, the, I think the answer to your question, as far as I can give it, first of all, you have to complexify the compactified Minkowski space. And then you look for these complex null surfaces in it, which I call alpha planes or beta planes. Well, that's the terminology coming from algebraic geometry. If you have a quadric, you have alpha planes. <laughs> See, the, the compactified Minkowski space is really a quadric. And you, you look at that, it's a four-dimensional quadric. Now, when you make that complex, that four-dimensional quadric has planes in it of two types. One is the alpha planes, and the other is the beta planes. Now, the points of twister space can be represented as the alpha planes in the complexified Minkowski space, compactified Minkowski space. And the, the planes in twister space are interpreted as the beta planes in twister space. In, in, sorry, in the complexified space-time. The, um, the points in the uh, complex, complexified in the space, space-time are the, the, what am I saying? The points, alpha planes and beta planes, um, the points of the lines in the, in the I mean, you, you have to, you, you, I mean, I, I'm not sure I'm answering your question very well, but the thing is you have to complex, the connection with compactified Minkowski space is not so immediate because you have to complexify it first. So you complexify the compactified Minkowski space, and that gives you a quadric, a complex quadric, four quadric. That complex four quadric has in it these alpha planes and beta planes, the points of twist space correspond to the alpha planes in this construction. The planes in twist space correspond to the beta planes, and the lines in twist space correspond to the points. If I've got that right. Is it the lines in twist space are the points? Yes, that's right. So that's where that, that is the answer to your question. I, I don't know if it's... Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I also don't know. Uh, so uh, I hope <laughs> no, this, answers, this answers... You really have to complexify it. I mean, you don't in the sense you can look at the Robinson congruences, if you like, That's but it's complicated. You can, you can find the families of these light rays which twist around in the nature of this compl complicated picture, which I showed you here. And you find those families of lines I mean, those are light families of light rays in the Minkowski space. Each one of those families of light rays twisting around gives you a point in twister space. So that that is it, if you like. It's it's not so simple. <laughs> you have to think of. I mean, that's what they call a Robinson congruence, because it was either Robinson who found these solutions of the Maxwell equations, which looked like the family of null lines which meet a null line. So you think of the light, a single real light ray, then all the light rays which meet that light ray form a family. Now he didn't like it very much because they had this singular place where that light ray is. So in order to try and construct solutions based on those families of light rays, he displaced the light ray shifted it, translated it by an imaginary amount. 
So it's displaced into the complex. But yet his light rays could be remain real. They could remain real. So we could still say this light ray intersects that displaced light ray to the complex. And that gave a family of light rays winding all over Minkowski space. Now that's what I named a Robinson congruence. Now the Robinson congruence is to do with this picture <laughs> of the Clifford parallels. I didn't know that already before I'd started you said, trying to understand Ivor's Robinson congruences. I mean, he didn't call them Robinson congruences, I did. But they represent this family of light rays which fill up Minkowski space, and they twist around in this complicated way. So I said, well, how do you, how do you understand what they look like? Well, you can take a plane through an ordinary space-like three planes. So you can say, take a moment of time in that space with the twisting lines. Now, a moment will, each of the light rays will intersect that plane in a certain direction. So you have in your three space, Euclidean three space, a family of directions. At each point, there will be a little arrow which tells you which way that light ray points. Now you find out that those little arrows point along these circles of this configuration. So that was exactly where it came from. I knew what these light families of light rays looked like. And so I knew it was this place here. And then I counted the dimension. That was a key point. I counted how many space, how many dimensions did it have? And I was really struck by the fact that it had six, six dimensions. The light rays themselves have five dimensions. You complexify them, you ought to get a 10 dimensional space. But in this way of looking at it, you only get a six dimensional space. So you've added one dimension. So that space is the twist, projective twister space. And the projective twister space adds one dimension to the things that you see directly. That's the light rays, if you like. Now, the fact that these can rep represent the angular momentum structure of a massless particle, I didn't know for a long time until later, but it really is physics. It tells you how the angular momentum of a massless particle would spin, how the angular momentum twists around itself as you move around space-time. And it actually does describe that. Now, I don't know if it's answering your question. You see, it's not quite the simple... Uh, I mean, if I'd have thought about it earlier, it would been the simple thing of saying, OK, well, it's uh, you know the same as compactive in Minkowski space looked in the... Well, it is looked in a funny way, but it's a very funny way. You have to look at these twisting congruences of lines, and those represent the points. That's what they are. So you take, in this compactified Minkowski space, those, Robins, those twisting congruences of lines, which are the Robinson congruences, and those represent the points of twisted space, of, of projective twisted space. Okay, well, that's the best I can do, I think. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I hope this uh, answers uh, the question. Uh, then I continue with the other questions we received. Okay. Um, so the next one is, what is your opinion on so-called twister string theory, where one should <laughs> a supersymmetric version of twister space as target space? Oh, this is a touchy question. <laughs> Well, you see, clearly it was a, I mean, it was a curious, how it came about historically is I was visiting Princeton and I visited Ed Witten and I talked to Ed Witten and he said he wanted to talk to me about something. And I was afraid he was going to talk to me about string theory and so on, which I wasn't too keen on because it had rather large number of dimensions, which I had reasons for not wanting to talk about, um, mainly because you, you have such a huge functional freedom and the things that you're describing in high dimensions have an enormous functional freedom and how you kill off all those extra degrees of freedom, I really didn't know. I mean, I don't think they do. I think there's a big problem in, in string theory for that kind of reason, if you have all those extra dimensions. But, but anyway, so I, I talked to Ed and he surprised me by talking about, he wanted to know more about twisters. And I was very struck by that and glad to talk to him about it. And so we did discuss these things a bit and he wanted to 
try and bring twisters into the picture somehow. And uh, I thought that was a nice idea. So he described, described to me what he was trying to do. And he said, well, if you're interested, I'll write a short note on this, which I'll send to you. So I said, sure, please send me a short note on this. I waited a couple of months and then I got this 100 page uh, <laughs> document on what you might call twist of strings. And I then told Lama Mason about it, and he got very excited about it, and and um, they started to. I think there was a conference really quite soon after this, in the next following. I, I think I visited Princeton in the autumn, and it was the following spring when there was a, a conference um, organized partly by Lama Mason. I think I can't remember Andrew Hodges possibly. Um, who who did the organizing, and uh, they wanted to learn more about how how string theory might be useful in twister theory, and in fact they, they, it did develop. Um, Andrew Hodges certainly um, benefited greatly from these notions of of. Uh, I think the, the trouble is, you see, as far as I was concerned, is that it's all right if you're still in four dimensions. But when you go up to talking about higher dimensions, then I lose the thread of it because of this functional freedom issue. But there was another point which didn't get clear at the, mo at the beginning, and I'm not sure how clear it was later on. But in a certain sense, the way that Witten was looking at the twister space was what I would call pseudo twister theory. Now, I'm using the word pseudo in a technical sense. It's not an insult. I should say absolutely clearly it's not an insult because in particular, the kind of geometry that's used in general relativity is pseudo Riemannian geometry. It's not Riemannian geometry, it's pseudo Riemannian geometry. Why is it pseudo? It's pseudo because the differential form that you're looking at is not positive definite. You have one of one sign and three. I like to have one plus sign and three minus signs. And that's why it's pseudo. It's a very respectable subject. It's the subject of Einstein's wonderful theory of general relativity. And if you talk about black holes, you have these features which you don't get in ordinary Manian geometry. I remember giving a talk in a long time ago when this was a, the Battelle Rencontres, and I did talk about um, the black holes, and I talked about the horizons. And I remember there were in the audience was um, uh, oh, a very distinguished mathematician. Oh, gosh, his name's gone out of my head this very second. Uh, and he was stunned by the fact that you get these features in pseudo-Romanian geometry that you don't get in ordinary Romanian geometry. So that is, you can have um, null things, and it makes the subject a different subject. I mean, a lot of things are the same. A lot of the calculations are the same. But when you talk about geometry and topology and things like that, it's really a different subject, and the techniques are different. So this was, was the point that I was trying to say, that pseudo, whatever the kind of geometry that you're talking about, can be an interesting subject. Okay, that's the point made. Now, when Witten got involved with twister theory, he tended to do the opposite thing. It was quite interesting because there are two types of pseudo twister theory. One of them is what I would call a tier twister theory, which is making your space time have all plus signs. So you make it have a nice subject, very lots of interesting things which have been used in, in differential geometry. And twister theory has a role to play, but it's there, pseudo twister theory of the kind where your differential form, well, your, your quadratic form, sorry, your quadratic form is all pluses, plus, 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 plus. So your space time, if you like, is all pluses. Fine, it's a different subject, fascinating subject, but it's a different subject. Now, Witten wanted to do the opposite thing. He wanted two pluses and two minuses. That's a different subject altogether. It's different in the sense, well, if you like, the all pluses subject is really quaternionic. It's quaternionic twister theory. 
the plus minus 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 subject, which I like, is a, is a complex. That's the complex subject. So it's complex analysis, which I like. <laughs> I'm fond of complex analysis. So the fact that it uses complex analysis was a great bonus as far as I was concerned. But that is the genuine twisted theory. I'm calling that the genuine one because that's the, the subject that I started it all off, you see. One plus and three minuses for your space time. Now, Witten wanted two pluses and two minuses for the space time. Why does he want that? He wanted that because then your twisted space is real. See, it's, the, the way it works is that the four pluses gives you a Quetonionic twister theory. The three, three, one, three and one gives you the complex twister theory. And the two pluses and two minuses gives you real twister theory. Okay, it's a different subject, but it's interesting because you can then talk about delta functions and step functions, and that's why Witten wanted it. He wanted to talk about things with step functions and delta functions, and if you want them, you've got to have a real subject. So that's why he had two pluses and two minuses. And a lot of twists of theory is done in that sort of framework. A lot of it is done... I, I've sort of left lost touch with a lot of the work that he's done. I thought Andrew Hodges did a lot of very interesting work, and I'm sure a lot of that can be um, tr translated back into the twister ideas, which um, the cohomology and all that sort of thing. I'm, I lost track of a lot of it, so I can't really... It's, it's what, what's being done in Oxford, as long as twister theory was still being done in Oxford. And then it tended to be maybe pseudo twister theory in the sense of two pluses, two minuses. In the, in the pure mathematics departments, it tended to be all, plus, all pluses. Um, the one plus and three minuses, I'm not sure how emphasized that was, but you kind of lost track of what the sign was and a lot of it was complex, I think. I don't know to what extent what I've said now is any kind of answer to your question. But it's what I was stimulated to say. <laughs> I can't remember what you were asking me about twisted diagrams or something. Uh, I think the question was, um, what is your opinion on twisted th the string theory? Uh, Twist well? a string theory. Right. Well, you see, that's the trouble I have is if it's got too many dimensions, I lose interest in it. Because, not because it's not a subject, I'm sure it's a subject, but it's got the wrong number of spatial dimensions. And it tends to be, oh, often it's got the ADS-CFT business where you're talking about um, anti sitter space. It's got the wrong sign for the cosmological constant. It's, all, it's a subject, but it's not physics, as far as I can see. What I think of as physics, you've got to have the signature right. You've got to have the right number of dimensions. To me, if you're really doing physics. Now, you could do these other subjects for, they might be interesting for all sorts of reasons. Um, but to what extent are they really physics? I think the idea is that at some stage you do a kind of wick rotation and you rotate it back into, into space time. But to me, that's not really, I mean, you're lucky if you get back to the right thing because wick rotations spoil the, the symmetry. You're not really talking, if you're talking about stationary systems, it's all right because you've already spoiled the symmetry. So then if you want to rotate the stationary time axis into an imaginary space axis or something, it's not so bad because you've already, you're already not talking about Lorentzian geometry, you're talking about rotation space, Euclidean, Euclidean space. So then it's all right. But so I guess I don't like it because it's got, the, depends what the subject is but it's got the wrong number of dimensions, and that's the more serious point, and the wrong sign for the cosmological constant, which is, it may not be what you're talking about here. That's the ADS-CFT, which says that. Um, the twist of strings is a, a meandering subject which involves, um, well, you see strings, tend to involve higher dimensions. If you could do it in, in, in the proper number of space-time dimensions, I'd be all for it. 
And when I first learned about string theory, I was all dead keen on the idea. I thought it was a really beautiful idea. And it was only when it sort of went drifting off and they decided they couldn't do it in three plus one dimensions. And so it had to introduce all these extra dimensions. But the trouble there is that if you treat them as like space dimensions, then your functional freedom, your functions are functions of that many parameters. When they're functions of that many parameters, there are far too many of them. You've got to cut down the number of functions you're interested in into those which have the same functional freedom as functions of, of three dimensions of space. I mean, you usually have a differential equation to carry you into time. So it's, it's the number, the functional freedom is functions of three variables. And twisted theory, as I understand twisted theory, sticks to that. That's my, my grumble, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a bit of a grumble, yes. All right, no worries. Um, I think since we are approaching 90 minutes, um, we would take one last question from the audience, maybe by Dan, who has raised his hand, um, and then we will finish the seminar. So please, Dan, okay. unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Oh, whoops, whoops. sorry. Hello, is there, there a question? Are. Um, oh, sorry. So uh, the question I had had to do a bit with the motivation of uh, of of uh, of the introduction of twisters. I'm sorry, I've missed the first few uh, few minutes of the talk, so it might be that you you said this, but um, <laughs> yes. yeah, 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 but, you, but um, the idea was to say to so I combined uh, geometry with this positive and uh, negative uh, frequency splitting, right? Yes, that, that's so, correct, yes, yes. But as far as I understand, the reason why you want to split into positive and negative frequency of quantum field theory is to construct yeah. a, a vacuum yeah. state, uh, which has a uh, positive momentum spectrum uh, and all yeah. that. And um, well, this is important for, let's say, Weidman quantum field theory. If you want, if you have a more general algebraic quantum field theory, this is not strictly necessary to do. And also, on a curved background, for instance, if you want to introduce a quantum field theory, there, there's not really an obvious split into positive and negative frequencies that you can do. So I wonder, when you say uh, splitting into positive and negative frequency is is uh, so a crucial element of quantum theory. Uh, how how you how you mean that exactly? Because I, that is something I did not fully yes. understand. Well, I, I think you see, you may have other ways which hide it, and and you don't sort of say it at once. I mean, it's there in quantum field theory. Of course, you've got to choose your vacuum and and issues. Uh, you're certainly right to say the splitting in, in a curved space is problematic. And this is all to do with the fact that quantum gravity is problematic. Now, you see, when people talk about quantizing general relativity and things like that, I worry about it. I think I worry in a way which wasn't so obvious a long time ago. Um, the worry is, is the following. Quantum gravity is but combining quantum mechanics and gravity in the way that you're imposing the rules of quantum mechanics on general relativity. The idea is somehow quantum mechanics is this correct theory, which is now to, all other theories of physics are to succumb to this theory. The trouble I have with quantum theory is that it is inconsistent with itself. Now, when I say that, I'm really talking about Schrodinger's cat, if you like. I'm talking about the fact that the Schrodinger equation does not describe the way the world behaves. The Schrodinger equation, provided your system can be maintained as a quantum system in the sense that we call a quantum system a quantum system, then you preserve unitarity and you don't collapse the wave function. Now, in the real world, the wave function collapses. And so you don't have unitarity evolution. I'm, I'm presenting my view, and I'm sure there are grumbles all over the room when I say these things. But the way that the observed real world behaves 
is not in accordance with the Schrodinger equation, as Schrodinger himself stressed very much. That's why he introduced his cat, after all. He's saying, my equation, and Schrodinger's equation, if you follow that equation, you produce a cat which is dead and alive in the same time, which is a load of rubbish. I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing what he was trying to say. Whereas people these days say, oh, well, we can have a very elaborate experiment which produces a Schrodinger's cat. No, well, that's, he wasn't trying to do that. He was trying to show up the problem in quantum mechanics, that the collapse of the wave function is not described in the theory. Now, many people take the view that it's conscious, or used to take the view that a conscious being comes along and looks at the state. I don't believe that works. It's not that. It's more the other way around. There is a physical process. Now, I tend to believe, and I definitely believe, I should say not tend to believe, that it is where gravity comes in. And that combining quantum mechanics with gravity is not so much imposing the rules of quantum mechanics on gravitational theory, it's, come to, it's coming to a nice compromise between these two mutually incompatible theories. Now, general relativity, and I do have this little argument that I presented sort of at the turn of the century, where you consider a little experiment in the room where you want to take the gravitational field into consideration. It's a quantum experiment, and you can do all your quantum mechanics, and there are two ways you might do it. One way is thinking of the gravitational field is just like any other field, put it in the Hamiltonian, chug away in the usual way. Okay, that's what most physicists would do. If you want to take general relativity, the, the Galilei-Einstein principle that you can eliminate gravity with free fall, then you do it another way. You choose your coordinates of free fall, you do your calculation all over again, you almost get the same answer. Why do I say almost? You get the same answer, except you're in a different vacuum. You get the vacuum of free fall. It's okay to do it that way. It's a different vacuum. It makes a difference only when you consider a varying gravitational field. So you might take a gravitational field, which is part of your calculation. So you might have a lump of material, which is put into a superposition of two locations. Then that superposition of two locations is part of your quantum system. How do you do that in, in the Galilei-Einstein perspective? You're stuck. Okay, you can start and try to do it, and you try to do it, and you find you can almost do it, but there's an error. There's a sort of, um, what I call a, well, you could call it an error. You could call it a uh, um, uncertainty. There's an uncertainty in the energy of the system. That uncertainty in the energy of the system comes about purely from the gravitational contribution. And this tells you, maybe, that your system has a lifetime. It's not going to live forever. Like the Heisenberg energy time uncertainty, it tells you that there's a, if you have an energy uncertainty, that suggests that your state has a lifetime, like an, uncer an, un an, um, an unstable particle unstable nucleus. It has an energy uncertainty which is reciprocally related to its lifetime. So that's the general idea, and that tells you that the collapse of the wave function is a gravitational phenomenon. Okay, this long-winded <laughs> um, tirade which I'm giving you here is meant to say that you want the, the, the most immediate physics we should do is to see how gravity affects quantum mechanics how to gravitize quantum mechanics and get rid of the collapse problem. That collapse problem is a gravitational problem, I'm saying. By experiments or by theory or by what, we ought to be able to see how it's a gravitational phenomenon. So that's the thing I'm trying to say. There is the other side of the problem. How does gravity succumb to quantum mechanics? Sure, at very, 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 very tiny scales. But it's at such a scale that it has nothing whatsoever to do with physics that we can directly observe, as far as I can see. If you're talking about 10 to the minus 32 centimeters or something, whatever it is, I can't remember. Um, okay, or has it got something to do with the Big Bang? Well, you might say, well, yes, but that's another story in another lecture, and I don't want to go into that here. But it's, it's all part of this query, where does quantum gravity come into observable physics? I think it's the other way around, where it's where gravity affects quantum mechanics, 
maybe it does come into observable physics, but it's not much good getting rid of the singularities in black holes this way, because they're in black holes and you don't see them. What good does it do you? <laughs> so that's the problem there. Might come into use when your black hole evaporates away by Hawking evaporation and you wonder about the little pop at the end. I don't know. But that's not much of, of observable physics at the present day. It could be if we think about cosmology, but that's another story. All right. Thank you. I think this is a good time to close today's seminar. Thank you once again, Roger Penrose, for introducing Twister Theory to the community of young researchers. And thank you to all of you for joining. And see you next time in the next seminar. Bye-bye. Thank you.